Worldwide, over 41% of all pregnancies that occur each year are unintended. More than one in 10 births are to teenage girls. In this age group, complications during pregnancy and childbirth or abortion are a leading cause of long-term problems, even death. Almost all of this could be prevented through the effective use of contraception. That's the opening of a video about World Population Day, which you can find at yourlife.com, a very impressive website with lots of useful information about contraceptive methods. World Contraception Day, September 26. Get out your condoms. Contraception is so much more than condoms, Dave. Let's talk in detail about the most important family planning tool, contraception, next on the Overpopulation Podcast. Welcome to the Overpopulation Podcast. I'm Dave Gardner, your co-host and executive director of World Population Balance, a small nonprofit busy alerting the world that we're overpopulated, but the solution is ethical, voluntary, and respectful of everyone's rights. Smaller families, freely chosen. And I'm Erica Arias, co-host and co-producer of the Overpopulation Podcast. Learn more about this issue at worldpopulationbalance.org and at oneplanetonechild.org. Before we get into contraception and a fascinating and really humorous conversation with our guests, Malcolm Potts and Alicia Graves, we have three major news items. First, our One Planet, One Child billboard campaign has kicked things up a notch. On the 21st of September, our billboards and transit shelter ads went up in Vancouver, Canada. More about that later in the episode. News item number two, Erica. Second episode of You Had Me at Child Free is out. Yay! Episode two of You Had Me at Child Free is finally out. This is a story about Mr. Lucas and Suhei, so hope you get to listen to that. Yeah, they're a pretty fascinating couple, pretty smart, so I would recommend it highly. Third, this just in, Planet of the Humans, the uh, Michael Moore executive produced documentary that we spent quite a bit of time talking about. Millions and millions of people saw it uh, this spring. Director Jeff Gibbs has scheduled a series of virtual events in Canada in October. Now, Erica, I don't know why Canada, but we're doing billboards in Canada, and Jeff Gibbs is doing virtual events in Canada. So They're we're, on to us. we're all going to be north of the border. <laughs> anyway, these virtual events are called, cleverly, Battle for the Planet of the Humans. I got a kick out of that. And it's a one-hour discussion with Jeff Gibbs and his co-producer, scholar, Ozzy Zanner, pretty smart guy. There are several dates throughout the month because they've set a different date for different cities across Canada. Now, I went ahead and registered for the Toronto one, uh, even though I don't live in Toronto. So I don't think it's geographically going to uh, keep you out if you live in Australia or Sweden or you want to do a different city than you live in. But, but clearly, if you're in one of those cities in Canada, you probably want to go to the event that is for your city because there might be some specific things about issues related to uh, sustainability in your community. Interesting. So all in Canada, is there plans to also do this for United States? I or? don't know. I haven't heard much from them and I didn't see anything about it. And this is not free. It costs a little bit of money, but it might be worth spending a few bucks. And then news item number four, moving right along because we've got such a great conversation coming up. The WWF released on the 9th of September, the 2020 Living Planet Report. This comes out every two years and it is a pretty darn comprehensive report card for uh, really kind of for how well we're behaving on the planet, how we're getting along with the planet, how the planet is doing, and it's largely doing well or not so well based on how well we're behaving. No surprise to you, Erica, we're not behaving that well, are we? Not at all. <laughs> no. And in fact, the headline from this is vertebrate species populations have declined by 68% since 1970. Yeah, I didn't get to read the full report, Dave. It was about 80 something pages, but it was, um, you know, I read enough because I, I was I was really hopeful that they would eventually stop tiptoeing around the issue of population. They would actually start giving it the recognition that it deserves. There were certain parts of the report where they spoke a little bit about COVID and climate change and all of these issues that we're seeing today. So I thought, okay, this would be the perfect opportunity to speak a little bit about population or about actual solutions that we have to solve these problems. And they did not go there <laughs> at all. 
Not even yeah. close. Yeah. And I, you know, my suspicion is that as the case with most environmental NGOs is they tiptoe around the human population issue. They might mention that with human population numbers where they are and growing as expected, there's a lot of pressure on our ecosystems. Here is the report card. Here are the problems. But rarely do they come back and return to human population numbers when they're talking about solutions. And, you know, we're not suggesting that you can ignore all the other solutions if you just get a handle on our numbers. Getting a handle on our numbers isn't going to be sufficient to get us back into sustainable balance with nature. But if we don't get a handle on our numbers, we're never going to get back into sustainable balance. And they'll, all of those other efforts will be for naught. They will be, uh, you know, one step ahead and two steps back. Right on the dot. Yeah. A link in the show notes to uh, news reports about this and the report itself. And also we'll include a link in the show notes to a really excellent response that was penned by Robin Maynard, the director of the UK-based Population Matters. Really an excellent response. Uh, and I just want to share with you one thing he pointed out was that the Living Planet Report neglects to note that the population of one vertebrate species, us, has doubled over that same period that we lost 68% of other vertebrate species. The topic of doing something about human population numbers is just avoided. And I'm not quoting Robin anymore. Um, I just want to editorialize briefly and say, you know, we don't have to do anything dramatic other than stop tiptoeing around the subject. The solutions, <laughs> the solutions are ethical, voluntary, humanitarian. We're already demonstrating them. We just need to get over our fear of them, celebrate them, accelerate them a little bit. Right. They just need to do their job <laughs> and educate the public about the reality of the situation. I mean, there wasn't even any mentioning about, you know, choosing smaller families or even liberating women all around the world to choose the size of their family, like to choose yeah. the number of children they want. So how do you do that? Well, contraception. In this episode, we talk all about that. And World Contraception Day is coming up and it's a really important day. And there was no mentioning of that. It just assumes that population is just going to keep growing and that there's nothing that we can do about it. But that's just not true. Brilliant segue to our guests, Erica. Well done. So let's get on with it. <laughs> let's get on with it. In honor of World Contraception Day 2020, I'm really excited to introduce two experts from UC Berkeley who are especially knowledgeable about reproductive health and why this day is especially important. Here today with us are Dr. David Malcolm Potts, who is a human reproductive scientist and professor of public health at the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Potts completed his medical degree and his PhD in embryology at the University of Cambridge and is the founding director of the Bixby Center for Population Health and Sustainability at the School of Public Health. For over a decade, while he was the first medical director of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, he introduced family planning methods into scores of developing countries. As CEO of the Family Health International, he launched the first large-scale studies of maternal mortality, which helped start the Worldwide Safe Motherhood Initiative. He has published 10 books and over 350 scientific papers and articles. His books include Abortion, Textbook of Contraceptive Practice, Queen Victoria's Gene, Ever Since Adam and Eve, The Evolution of Human Sexuality, and Sex and War, How Biology Explains Warfare and Terrorism, and offers a path to a safer world. His current efforts focus on the OASIS, which stands for Organizing to Advance Solutions in the Sahel Initiative, which is a global multidisciplinary partnership working on solutions to the increasingly complex problems in global health and development in Sahel. Alicia Graves is also here with us today, and she is the co-founder of the OASIS initiative. Alicia completed her master's in public health with an emphasis on international maternal and child health at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health in 2006. Alicia worked for six years as the director for venture strategies for health and development to improve access to mesoprostol, a generic essential medicine. In this role, she worked on policy initiatives, drug registration, and operations research in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you. 
Ordinarily, I would tell Erica, you've got to shorten that introduction, but we're just talking to two very, very impressive people who have phenomenal knowledge. So, so I wanted everybody to know about the, certainly the long and storied career of Malcolm Potts, and I'm really glad to get a chance to uh, get to meet you, Alicia. I mean, the focus of our episode today will be to hear a little bit more from the experts, Malcolm and Alicia, two uh, really prominent speakers about reproductive health and uh, making sure that women have access to contraception all around the world. But World Contraception Day is really important. And I want to go ahead and just say that this is a day that launched in 2007 and has since fallen on September 26th every year. The purpose of this day is just to improve awareness of contraception and to enable young people all around the world to make informed choices about their sexual and reproductive health. And the annual worldwide campaign centers around a vision where every pregnancy is wanted. And this is an idea that we talk a lot about here on the Overpopulation podcast. And it's it's just really important that we say that and we acknowledge that. You can find out more about all of this stuff at their website, which is www.yourlife.com. That's your-life.com. Um, you will find a wealth of information about STI prevention and birth control options available. More than just condoms out there, it is 2020, so really exciting stuff. We will provide links at our show notes for you to find out more about that. So without further ado, um, Malcolm and Alicia. I guess, do you guys have anything to kind of say about World Contraception Day before we kind of jump into main topics? I'm a gynecologist. My paternal grandmother died in childbirth. And that's one of the most horrible things that can possibly happen. Not only does the woman dead, but the existing children suffer. And so I'm very concerned about how to stop maternal deaths. And one of the most powerful methods is by making family planning available. We did a study where we compared um, maternal deaths in Sweden in 1900 and in the year 2000. And in 1900, if they'd had obstetric things, but they had the family planning of today, then they would have had 50% fewer deaths. So as a gynecologist, I have to recognize that the wonderful reduction in maternal deaths during the 20th century is half due to clever gynecologists like me, but half due to giving women choices so they do not have children when it's very young or very old or if they are, um, have some other risk factor. So family planning saves lives. It also saves infants' lives. If you space your children more than three or four years apart, they're more likely to survive. So family planning prevents literally many millions of infant deaths every year. The default position for any normal, loving, human, heterosexual couple is about 10 children, unless they have a way to separate sex from childbirth. Queen Victoria was the richest woman in the world. She was very well educated, but she and Albert had no way to separate sex from childbirth. So she ended up having 10 children. She hated being pregnant, but she couldn't stop it. So making family planning accessible to people is the key to giving women the freedom to control their own bodies. When you're a slave, you cannot make decisions about your body. If you're a woman, and you don't have access to family planning, you cannot make decisions about when to have children. You are a slave, and that's something we want to change. So family planning is essential, highly cost-effective, and it's not telling women what to do, it's giving them what they want. Now, Malcolm, you've had to be a defender of that for decades, haven't you? What, does it confound you that you have to work so hard to defend that? Yes, it, I think many societies, including the United States to some extent, have a strong patriarchal tradition. Men are always trying to control women's reproductive lives, and women are trying to escape that control. Basically, that is the history of family planning over the last 4,000 years. In fact, 4,000 years ago, there was an oral contraceptive called silphium. It was a plant that seems to have been effective when used as a medicine. It's mentioned by Hippocrates and Pliny the Elder and various other people. And it was so successful, it was harvested to extinction. <laughs> so when we had a good contraceptive, we destroyed it. Now we have a good choice. I mean, condoms are a good idea if it's a new sexual relationship. If you're a woman, you don't want to get a sexually transmitted disease and become infertile. The pill is an excellent choice, and I will come back to that. But hormone-releasing contraceptives are reversible and very effective. So the modern woman 
spends about 10 years or more trying not to get pregnant. Then she, on average, has about two children in about five years. And she'll spend another 10 years trying not to get pregnant again before the menopause. So women spend most of their adult life trying not to get pregnant. So making contraception accessible is absolutely vital to the health and welfare and happiness of men as well as women across this country and across the planet. So men spend most of their time trying to have sex and the women spend most of their time trying not to get pregnant. Trying to separate sex from getting pregnant. And I would just add, Malcolm, uh, when you say modern women, I think you're referring to women in parts of the world where women have equal choice, where women have aspirations to work outside the home, where women are equally educated and can have access to contraception. And that is, uh, it's wild to think about the decades that we spend trying to separate sex from pregnancy and childbearing and um, the very short window of time where, you know, women in, let's say, uh, most of North America and Western Europe and some other parts of the world are, you know, on average having, having the two children that they want. A startling fact is the following. I was lucky enough to know Gregory Pincus, who invented the pill. When the pill was invented in Boston in the 1950s and 60s, it was illegal to use contraceptives in Massachusetts. They had to do their first studies in Puerto Rico. So this really tells you something. It was illegal to use a contraceptive in the very state that invented all contraceptives. Wow. That was changed by the Griswold opinion of the Supreme Court in 1965. But until 1965, many, many societies many states made contraception illegal. I never thought about the the fact that my parents were married in in Fall River, Massachusetts in the mid 60s. And uh, I wonder if my mom was using contraception illegally because she didn't have my older brother until a few years after their marriage. I'm going to have to look into the timeline. It's hard to believe that it's you don't have to go that far back in history to reach the dark ages of good reproductive rights and reproductive health for women. And because the drive to decide their own pattern of childbearing is so strong, even when family planning is illegal or abortion is illegal, people still break the law, but often they suffer. They have to be exploited or get fined or go to prison or or, or suffer bad side effects like women who have unsafe abortions. Right. And, you know, next to what could be a form of enslavement for the rest of their lives, that might be the risk that yes. they're willing to take, unfortunately. And it's it's putting themselves at risk. It's putting that prospective child at risk. Yeah, it's... Well, um, I, I, yeah, I love that you compared it to um, yeah. slavery. It is, it is in yeah. fact, a form of slavery. I know that... I, 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 go ahead, Malcolm. Um, my experience in London when abortion was illegal and I worked in a hospital was that once a woman just decided to end that pregnancy, nothing will stop her. Not the price, not the fear, not the exploitation. Um, I did a study in Ethiopia. One of the things we asked women who had an unsafe abortion, did they have to give sex to the abortionist as well as pay money? And about 10% did. As many abortionists are men. And so giving sex to the man is part of your payment. And that's just a sort of viscerally disturbing fact about how women are exploited and how much they suffer when contraception and safe abortion are illegal. Sub-Saharan Africa is the part of the world that has the highest number of abortion-related deaths, and fortunately that is falling. But as of a few years back, it was about uh, 9% of maternal deaths due to unsafe abortion. That's about 16,000 deaths of women um, in the prime of their lives per year. And we know that almost all of those are avoidable because abortion is a procedure. So I think it's uh, important to keep that in mind. Absolutely. I'm going to kind of jump forward a little bit. The Bixby Center, I want to I want to say for any of our listeners who aren't familiar with the Bixby Center, where Malcolm and Alicia both work and work with students, it really stands out. And there are a number of Bixby Centers, one in UCLA, there's one at UCSD. But the Bixby Center at Berkeley is the only one, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is the only one that directly speaks about population and sustainability. So why reproductive health access is important 
on a global scale, why does that matter? And it says their mission statement, I'll read it. The Bixby Center for Population Health and Sustainability is dedicated to efforts to achieve slower population growth, improve maternal health, and address the unmet need for family planning within a human rights framework. The Bixby Center also seeks to improve the health outcomes of the world's poorest and most vulnerable women and their families. Meeting this need will make possible a healthier, more prosperous, ecologically sustainable, and less divided world. That's just core right right there. I mean, we talk about that here on this podcast. And when I first stumbled upon the Bixby Center at UC Berkeley, I reached out to Malcolm maybe about a year ago, just really, you know, fangirling and saying, oh my goodness, I love that this a center like this exists because it's just it's very rare to see something like this in academia where you have reproductive health advocacy and sustainable population and environmental advocates work together for the same mission and they might be focusing on different projects but the main goal is really just to ensure a healthy and Happy future for women, children, whether they're alive today or whether they will be alive in generations to come. So it's all about everybody's health and wellness. And we talk a lot about that here. So I just wanted to make a a side note about that. Erica, in fairness to UCSF, Joe Spidell, who used to be with USAID, is also a leader in family planning. And UCSF, I think, has an excellent record in trying to make family planning accessible. Right, right. But do they directly speak about population sustainability? Yeah, I think uh, Malcolm and the current chair of the Bixby Center, Dr. Ndola Prata, and Malcolm's wife and my former boss, Martha Campbell, have um, gone a long way to promote the idea that it is it's not only acceptable, it's necessary to both be concerned about sexual reproductive rights and population. And Martha had a great of the population factor that we have to keep population in mind as we think about all of the rights and all of the, for example, sustainable development goals we want to see did and achieved around the world. And in fact, if we don't think about population in very rapidly growing parts of the world, it's going to be impossible to secure individual reproductive rights and health. Because take the context of Niger, for example, which is growing at 3.9% a year already huge deficiencies in health, huge deficiencies in education. It's impossible to imagine for me and for me, I've tried to think about develop programs with how these trees can both close that gap and keep up with this pace of population growth and ensure that every woman in these countries have quality education, have access to health services and, you know, reproductive health and rights guaranteed. And you can't only think about the individual. And of course, you can't only think about the population context. It's necessary to think about both. I'm so glad you said that. And you you have, you know, why is this even noteworthy? It's noteworthy because there's been so much pressure for many, many years to be covert about the population number aspect of family planning, right? Yeah. So my motto has always been family planning is listening to what people want, not telling them what to do. There are approximately 80 million more births and deaths since the last population day a year ago. And there are also approximately 80 million unintended pregnancies in the world every year. That's what surveys suggest. So really family planning ought to be a breeze because, you know, we could balance the world's population growth tomorrow if we could make things reasonably accessible. And currently, only 1% of foreign aid goes to family planning. It's never been more than that. And a great deal was achieved in that way. I mean, countries like South Korea, where I work, Thailand, reasonably economically successful and reasonably sort of semi-democratic at the present moment. And they wouldn't have got there if they hadn't been given access to family planning in the 1960s and 70s. And so if we could double the money flowing to family planning from 1% of foreign aid to 2%, I'm absolutely convinced, based on 50 years' experience, that we would have a significant slowing of population growth and perhaps, you know, have 6 billion people on the planet by the year 2100 instead of 9 to 10 billion. So a small thing of a huge leverage because it's something that people want. And wouldn't that reduce the number of abortions at the same time? It would do, yes, yes. I mean, the best way to reduce abortions is A, to make it legal, because illegal abortionists don't give you contraception afterwards. 
Whenever I've done an abortion, I've always said to the woman, you know, can I help you with contraception? Usually they say yes. So that makes a difference in the num- to the number that recur. So those countries that make abortion legal, like Great Britain or South Korea, have few abortions than the, those that make it illegal. On unintended pregnancy, Malcolm or Alicia, or both of you, would you say most people are familiar with LARC options or are we still really relying strongly on the pill and condoms? Um, I think, first of all, there's a lot of misinformation about contraception, particularly about the pill. And everybody would benefit if, it, if there was more open, accurate information on all methods of contraception. And that needs exactly what you're doing in this podcast. It needs something that we do in, in school, that we do when we educate people. We need to give people easy access to information. We need to advertise things. And we need a sense of humor. Um, condoms <laughs> are one of the oldest, well, coitus interruptus, uh, which Onan practiced in the Old Testament and was killed by God for doing that, is the oldest method we have. But condoms go back to the 16th century. But you need a sense of humor. So I once owned proudly owned the world's largest condom. (laughs) It was 34 feet across. It was a 77,000 cubic foot hot air balloon. It was yellow, nipple-ended, and it was the only condom you needed air traffic control to get it up, and the only (laughs) condom that could carry two people. (laughs) Well, Malcolm, I'm pretty impressed that you needed a condom 34 feet. (laughs) Even the threat of flying it in North Carolina got a lot of a lot of. <laughs> That's great. And what were you doing with that? Um, the certificate of latex lifetime that runs out in condoms. Beware of that. Condoms have quite a short shelf life. They're a high quality latex, and you always want to look at the date when you do it. Well, you know, we really wanted to pick your brains about these other forms of contraception besides the condom because we have these conversations. We're in the middle of uh, you know a, a billboard campaign in Vancouver that uh, we'll talk about a little bit at the end of this podcast, and we needed you know some kind of a visual symbol of family planning and. It seemed like a condom was a, you know, really quickly universally understood symbol. And yet, uh, you know, Erica wisely said, Dave, we can't do that because, you know, how many 22-year-old guys even want to use a condom? That's low on their priority list. And here we are, people in the overdeveloped world, people who are empowered and educated. Apparently, many of them really don't fully understand all the other options available to them. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I'll just quickly say to Dave and and, uh, Malcolm and Alicia that that is also grounded by a lot of research on uh, like sexuality research on motivations and people making decisions prior to engaging in sexual inter- <laughs> um gosh i guess um before having sex <laughs> they um a lot of people don't use condoms uh, and there are a lot of different factors like familiarity if you are familiar with your partner or, or even a new partner who you you know feel a sense of safety we're really bad at making decisions especially sexual decisions and so you know if we feel even just the slightest bit of safe around somebody the research kind of tells us we're not going to use a condom so that was my concern with using something that a lot of people are not really that motivated to use even though they know the benefits of using condoms. <laughs> yeah, and there's still a lot of importance there in terms of preventing uh, sexually transmitted diseases that some of the other contraceptive options don't do. But oh, yeah. uh, Alicia, I hope that you have some words of wisdom for us. I wanted to say I see both of your points. I mean, I think the, the great thing about the condom is it's in the shape of a penis. And so it will get a lot more attention than, for example, an IUD, which people will have no idea what that looks like, even <laughs> people who may have one inserted. Yeah. But I think, Erica, to your original question about how knowledgeable people are about these long-acting reversible contraception, I think in parts of the world where people have good health services, where they have counseling, where there's comprehensive sex education taught at school, and that's not, there are a lot of places in the U.S. where that's not currently happening. But anyhow, where, where there's good counseling and family planning methods, I think that those are, are included. And I think in, in parts of the world where people don't have those, the, the counseling and correct information, this is there's still a lot of misinformation about the long-acting methods, the hormonal methods, and, uh, and a lot of fear of use because fear is often rooted in, in a, you know, not understanding something and how something works. There's great news, like in rural Niger, where people have, you know, some of the, where women have some of the least decision-making power in the world, you know, they piloted 
the injectable contraceptive, many people know it as Depo-Provera, and where they piloted it, they had a kind of demand generating activity. They did radio show to tell women about this, this new method that was available, how they could get it, where and when. And 70% of the women who showed up for it were first time users of modern contraception. So that shows that there's the latent demand that's that's not currently being met and we need to do more to meet it and we especially need to do more to make the long-acting reversible contraceptives available in parts of the world where women could really benefit from a discrete and long-acting method. Some years ago, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists um, did a study of women's knowledge of the pill. And one question was, is taking the pill more or less dangerous than having a baby? And about a third of the women said that it was. Secondly, the question was, does it kill, give you cancer? And about half the women said it did. And I then repeated that study in 12 other countries and got very much the same results. And that really is uh, tragic because the pill is the only thing that I can prescribe as a doctor which significantly reduces the lifetime risk of several cancers, ovarian and uterine cancer, melanomas, bowel cancer. So... Uh, we need to sort of understand the, the pill, first of all, in the framework of the way that the modern woman is burdened with many risks of reproduction, which your ancestors didn't have. In a hunter-gatherer society, the mean age of puberty is 18 years, and that's the mean age. So some girls don't ovulate until they're 21. They could have gone to university, but they're living in the highlands of New Guinea, so they can't do that. So... And then we originally um, spaced our babies by intensive breastfeeding in women that were not very well fed and were probably doing a lot of exercise. And in that framework, intensive breastfeeding is a very effective contraception. It suppresses ovulation. So basically, oral contraceptives simply imitate breastfeeding. They have exactly the same hormone profile to prevent ovulation. So nothing could be more uh, natural and it's our ancestors may have had 60 or less fewer menses in a lifetime. The modern woman can have 300 or more in a lifetime. That is highly unnatural. It's also dangerous. The more frequently you shed the uterine epithelium and then you have multiplied the cells, multiply to replace it. Multiplying cells always have a risk of um, developing a mutation. It's going to give you cancer. So that's why the pill... Um, using the pill significantly reduces uterine cancer. So we need to see this in a broader context and how, particularly how oral contraceptives sort of recreate the world in which we evolved. And so a million women in the United States use the pill for non-contraceptive benefits. And my vision is that in coming years, more and more women uh, will take the pill simply to eliminate menstrual periods. Why have these tiresome things? You don't need to. Just throw away the reminder tablets and continue taking the pill. I did the world's first study on that about 20 years ago, and half the women in the study said, this is the most fantastic thing. Why didn't you do it earlier? And the other half said, we feel it's unnatural not to bleed 28 days. We're always giving women choices. But I think in future, more and more women will control this tiresome, often painful, messy process of menstruation, which only really evolved because it was a pretty rare event. Um, so that I think is an interesting sort of perspective on the pill. Yeah. Uh-huh. The first time I heard about this idea was in a um, cultural anthropology course. One of my professors shared this idea and the number of hands that went up after was just <laughs> <laughs> everybody wanted to talk about that because nobody, I mean, we are brought up to think we're supposed to have our periods. Like that is our entrance into a womanhood. And every month is just a reminder of that. And I mean, it, this this was just a, an idea that we were all really obsessed with. And that really is uh, misinformation. I mean, hundreds of menstrual cycles is unnatural and dangerous. So having a few menstrual cycles is, is natural. There are a few of the, the, the other large primates, the orangutans and gorillas also menstruate. And there's also a species of bats that menstruates. And menstruation really is a way when pregnancy does not occur, of speeding up the next possible pregnancy. And that's what Charles Darwin or God intended for, you know, the evolution of human sexuality, that you should be able to get pregnant quite quickly. And that's why it's quicker to shed the tissue you don't use and to reabsorb it, as most other animals do. Well, I got an IUD after my, my second and final child, and uh, that was eight years ago, and I haven't had a period since, and I, I don't miss it at all. 
Same here, girl. I've had three IUDs, no period. I don't remember what it's like to have a period. I know. I'm very patient with my friends who complain about theirs now because I don't, I'm lacking the uh, empathy. I was actually going to get my um, tubal ligation this year before COVID. And my doctor actually asked me, well, are you sure? Don't you like not having a period? Because if you get this done, yes. you're going to have a period again. And I had to really yeah. think about that. <laughs> like, mm, I don't know. Well, and I want to ask a, as a one of the men, you know, I'm going to separate myself from Malcolm because, wow, what a fount of knowledge you are. Me, I'm going to plead ignorance here a little bit. So the dumb question I want to ask is, I thought that uh, there were some negative side effects of the pill that made it kind of less desirable for at least some significant portion of women out there. No, when the pill was first introduced and it was a high dose and there were some deaths from cardiovascular disease, and people were very afraid of it. And I remember the women I was giving it to, and I worked out, I said, look, the pill has risks. It's equivalent to smoking one third of a cigarette a day, and the women would relax and take it. We don't even have that risk today. Unless you're over 35 and smoke, the pill basically is very, not only safe, but you live longer. The British had a wow. study, I remember it starting, of 27,000 women using the pill and set 27,000 matched controls with the same history, the same pattern of childbearing, the same socioeconomic backgrounds. And those people were studied for 39 years. And the women taking the pill lived longer than the women not taking the pill because of this reduction in ovarian, uterine cancer, melanomas, bowel cancer, all nasty cancers. And also, um, for some Reduction in heart disease over a lifetime, a slight jump in heart disease when you're taking the pill and then a long term lifetime reduction. So the pill really is taking us back to the world in which we women evolved, in which our pattern of childbearing evolved our, uh, with a late puberty and probably several years between each pregnancy brought about by intensive breastfeeding in basically hungry women that are exercising a lot when ovulation is suppressed. So the pill, is, there could not be anything more natural than the, the pill. And um, a third of teenagers are taking the pill for non-contraceptive reasons because it gives them lighter, um, less painful, more regular periods. So this way in which the pill can eliminate periods is, I think, something that women need to know about. Uh, it's perfectly safe. In fact, they probably are better off if they do suppress periods for many intervals. So we've got to see where we came from in evolution. And the modern woman is not using her reproductive system in the way that God or Charles Darwin intended. You're not having that early puberty and you're having uh, more periods. For the atheists and uh, feminists listening, I'd say uh, another way to phrase what Malcolm just said is that when you say modern women aren't using our periods the way that God or Charles Darwin intended, I think you mean that something has gone a little bit off in terms of the, the frequency and then the total number of years that women have periods for, and that it's not really in line with what's best for our bodies. I hear what you're saying, Malcolm. I, I like the way you said it, but I think some women might have a knee-jerk reaction to no man's going to tell me how I'm going to have my period and I don't believe in God. <laughs> so 12 or more years ago, I published a scientific paper projecting population growth in the Sahel. The Sahel is the Arabic word for shore. This is the shore of the Sahara Desert. Basically, we're focused on the Francophone countries of Africa, like Burkina Faso, Mali, Chad, etc. And there was going to be the most rapid population growth in the history of humankind. And universities are interesting places because there was at the meeting, I've forgotten the topic. I just happened to sit next to somebody from the, the laboratory who was a climatologist. And I was just chatting away. And he said, well, that's interesting. And he has a supercomputer. And he went away and ran the supercomputer. And he just fell off his chair because he found that Sahel has the most rapid climate change in the world. So when you put the most rapid population growth in the world with the most rapid climate change, you have a sort of existential challenge. And that is what Alicia and I and a growing number of people and our wonderful colleagues in Sahel itself have been focusing on. Because now is the time to act. Now is the time to give women and men the choices that they need. And as Alicia was saying, if you give offer them something like 
type of affair, they will take it. And um, we've been also striving with considerable success to keep girls in secondary education. And in about 3,000 girls, we've raised the age of marriage from 14.9. That was the average age, means means they're 12-year-old brides, to 17 and a half. And for an adolescent woman, that's a big stride. So, you know, we know what to do. Uh, we have to have the funds and the political will to do it. I would add to that, Malcolm, Niger is, is really at the heart of the Sahel. And uh, it's just north of Nigeria, for listeners. But it's the country with the fastest growing population in the world. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. And it has been and will continue to be unduly affected by climate change. With the air temperatures going to increase by two to three degrees Celsius, that's about three and a half to five and a half degrees Fahrenheit by middle of the century. Most of the people are smallholder farmers or pastoralists that depend on the land that's being compromised, both because of population pressures and because of climate change. But what I want to say is this, I gave the example earlier about this latent demand for modern contraception, but it's also important to acknowledge that there's really a desire for large families. And in fact, women report wanting 10 children and they currently have about seven and a half. So it has to be acknowledged. And it's not that it can't be that there are women who want large families and there are women who want to space or limit their childbearing in the same country, of course. But I think a big part of the picture in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world where, where women don't have the real decision-making power over their lives and girls don't have access to education is that question of education is key. And when girls aren't um, staying in school, they're often married early. They go into a marriage um, with very little power in the family dynamic. And I think that the more we can do in, in those parts of the world to educate girls, the more it's going to contribute to demand generation. Because when women aspire to work outside the house, when they have dreams, they're more likely to want to use family planning. They have a better ability to access family planning, understand it, and importantly, to negotiate with their partners and their families. So I want to mention that that's an important part of what we're trying to do is scale up this special approach to keeping girls in school that's called safe spaces for girls. Northern Nigeria, Niger, and Chad are the countries with the earliest age of marriage. And in the part of northern Nigeria where we've been working called Kaduna State, for the girls participating in the Safe Space Program, we saw an increase in the age of marriage from 14.9 to 17.5 years. And that two and a half years period is critical for the development of a girl's body, but also for a chance for her to get more out of school, learn more about life, find her voice, et cetera. So that's impressive. And then the other point is that the, the, the reason that there was that delay in marriage is because girls were staying in school. And the percent of girls who completed secondary school amongst our increased from about 4% to over 80% in the communities where we are offering safe space programming. How is that program being funded? Good question, Dave. It's currently being funded from donations from individuals and from foundations. And we are seeing more and more that big donors like government donors, overseas aid, World Bank, et cetera, are investing in this type of program. But my back of the envelope calculation is there are about 5 million early adolescent girls in the Hausa ethnic group in northern Nigeria and Niger who would benefit from this kind of programming. And we're currently only able to reach about 50,000. We're mapping out a plan to scale up, and I think it needs to happen as quickly as, and as well as possible. So it's easy for our listeners who are inspired to contribute to the funding of this? It certainly is. If you go to venturestrategies.org, you can find a link to donate and you can specify that it's for girls' safe space programs. We'll add a link in the show notes for anybody who wants to contribute and help be a part of a really cool project. No, no, it's been thrilling to see the success in that field. But access itself does have an impact. I mean, I've worked a lot in Thailand, in South Korea, in Bangladesh. When I started, the average total fertility rate was six, not very far off uh, Niger. And nobody that I met said, I want to have two children. But some of them said, oh, well, perhaps I'll have five. And after a couple of years, some of them said, well, my neighbor's got five, perhaps I'll have four. And so accessibility, and as women and men understood that they control their fertility, sort of fed back into itself mm. and accelerated the fertility decline. But it began with the access with people talking about it. And you may, may not wish to use this, but let, let me tell you a perfectly true story. 
about, in this case, about male sterilization vasectomy. Vasectomy is a very simple five-minute operation. And an Indian friend of mine, who was the health officer for Mumbai, the huge city with enormous slums, and he was trying to make vasectomy available. And he had a little exhibition and it had a panel for the pill for an IUD for vasectomy. And behind the vasectomy panel, there was a man who'd had a vasectomy. And if somebody seemed interested, he would say, well, would you like this operation? And a lot of men put their names or their thumbprints on a list. And they were told to come to the hospital, you know, on Tuesday evening at five o'clock. And very few of the people who put their name down came. (laughs) So one day, Dr. Pai went to the railway station and saw a man put his thumbprint and talk to the person promoting vasectomy. And he went up to him and said, you know, so you're going to have a vasectomy? And the man said, I have five children, I live on the pavement, don't ask me silly questions, I don't want any more. So Dr. Pai said, are you going to come to the hospital at five o'clock on Tuesday? And the man said, no. And Pai shook him, (laughs) he shouldn't have done that. He said, how can you be so stupid? (laughs) And he said, in India, you only go to hospital to die. If this operation's safe, why do I have to go to a hospital? Wow. And for Dada Pai, this was his sort of, you know, his switching point. He realized that it's not fact, it's perception. So very impulsively, he said, if I did the operation here on platform nine, would you have it? The man said, of course. <laughs> so Dada always had a bottle of whiskey, which was illegal in Maharashtra. And he went to the station master. And next morning, he had a little table, he had a little tent, he had a little thing of boiled sterilized instruments in. And in one month, he had done more operations on the railway station than in all the hospitals of Bombay in the previous year. Wow. And I know that's true because that's where I learned to do vasectomies on platform nine of the busiest railway station in the world, (laughs) which you can find if you want to put a picture on it, (laughs) the Victoria Station. It really is the busiest thing in the world. Great story. Great story. I think it has 30 platforms. And every week, several people fall off the trains. I mean, there are as many outside as there are inside, and it's just an extraordinary place to do operations. And very safe. I mean, there are no you know, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. It might be a bit of coal dust, but that's okay. Catastrophic thing is to happen with child marriage, which I've seen as an obstetrician, is that um, you know, a 12- or 14-year-old girl is not physically fully grown. And so when it comes to delivery, they can't push the baby through the still sort of incomplete uh, birth canal. And the head of the uh, baby gets trapped in the vagina. And it's there for so many hours that two things happen. One, it begins to sort of rot and then the bones collapse and the dead infant is discharged. But it's been there for so long that it's damage the vaginal walls. And then the woman has a, a, fist- a fistula that leads into the bladder or the rectum, or both. And for the rest of her life, she will drip urine or feces. Uh, Her husband will throw her out. Nobody wants to be near her. There are thousands of women, and there are now very good hospitals, which I know about, which can repair those damage. But that's just something absolutely horrible that's still happening, and it's um, one of the many reasons for being very enthusiastic for raising the age of marriage in adolescent women. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm speechless. I, I really do. I'm enjoying listening to you both share about this. Okay. Well, one of the things that never ceases to impress me is the courage and inspiration of people in very difficult circumstances. In Addis Ababa, there's a very large fistula hospital. And one of the women um, had developed a, a fistula. She had to spend several years to save one of the bus that would bring her to a Addis Abba. And when she had the fistula repaired, her husband had thrown her out. She couldn't afford to go anywhere else. So she remained in the hospital and she brought cleaned the floors and things like that. Then she began to wash the instruments after the surgery, so before they went in the sterilizer. And then one day the, the other nurse was not there, so she went into the operating theatre and helped hold the instruments. And now she does these operations, which is, I wouldn't like to do them because each one is different. They're very, very challenging. So I think it's absolutely fascinating to see this woman who had suffered so much now help doing the difficult but very necessary surgery to um, restore these other women to their natural lives. And it's just so, inspiring, so uplifting to have the privilege of meeting such people that have overcome such terrible suffering. Yeah. Was this woman able to get the surgery too? Yes. So she um, 
the, the British Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, who I belong to, actually uh, made her an honorary member. I mean, here was somebody doing very difficult surgery with no training as a doctor. Now, she, you know, she wouldn't know how to treat somebody's ears or gallbladder, but she's very, very good at doing what's a very difficult operation. And um, she will spend the rest of her life there. And she's just a joy. She's called Mamiti. And like many of these women, she's about five foot one tall. Um, they're often very short women, which is why they have these problems in delivering their babies. But it's, it's a privilege to have known her or to know her. So we've been on for about an hour, so we probably should think about what is left that we absolutely must talk about before we wrap up. Oh, Malcolm, you said you were going to start a podcast at one point. I don't know if you actually did or if you want to share about that, but I think that's pretty cool. To be transparent, you know, I'm a founder of the Cadence Health, and our mission is to take the pill off prescription, which there's good scientific evidence. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians says this is what you ought to do. Uh -huh. And the only reason the pill remains on prescription is that big pharma makes more money from prescription than over-the-counter pills. So only little pharma, which is what we are, is ever going to do this. But you have to own the formulation. It was our first barrier, but we now own a very well-used pill, and we know a lot about it. And um, we're probably about halfway and several million dollars expended to do the things that the Food and Drug Administration requires. They're perfectly reasonable for the safety of women. We have to show that the package we have designed, that women will read it when they're in the pharmacy or the gas station, wherever they're buying it, and that those women who shouldn't take it, like women over 35 who smoke, will follow the instructions on the packet. But that, you know, there's 12 million women in this country that have no insurance, but there are lots of professional people. And why waste time going to a doctor when you can buy this thing over the counter? Um, so that's something that I'm interested in. In, uh, in 1969, uh, Buzz Aldrin had landed on the moon. And the first thing he said was one small step for man and one giant step for mankind. And the Reader's Digest had the sayings of the decade. And the one after Buzz Aldrin was by a man called Malcolm Potts. <laughs> and he said, all contraceptives should be in vending machines and cigarettes on prescription. I think that's true. <laughs> Malcolm, you may have mentioned your podcast to Eric because you have a, a great idea for, yes, a, yes, yes. for a podcast or I guess a go for it. The Foundation for Universal Contraceptive Knowledge. F-U-C-K. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. That's <laughs> that awesome. You are hilarious. So you could probably get on uh, Late Night with Stephen Colbert to talk about that, I bet. With a, with a colleague, um, Julia Walsh, we once had some money and we had a little office outside the campus. And on the outside, it said Foundation Universal Constitutive Knowledge. Nobody ever commented on it. <laughs> but I think, you know, it might go viral. Do you think it would go viral if we called that? For <laughs> and I think that's what we should do. Because it's also a good description of what we're doing. Yes. Yeah, we're going to have to put our thinking caps on. We'll promote it on here. <laughs> That's awesome. You should. It's interesting. I mean, sex is so powerful. You know, the words sort of only last a few hundred years. So when Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, he used the word swive. The swived was the miller's wife, which was the word from swivel, really. It was just the dirty word at the time. F is the Norse word for push. So when the Vikings jumped into their boat, they said, F off the boat and they pushed it <laughs> and then it's you know become dirty because it and it's curious how something that is so beautiful and so important for most of us is also a, a swear word i mean it's it's an odd thing really when you think about it well we obviously need to put together a comedy tour and have both you and michai viravidya doing stand-up <laughs> <laughs> if anyone knows how to get malcolm on stephen colbert I, I would do everything i can to to push that effort yeah that would be awesome in sausalito they have a national condom year and they have the prize for the best condom couplet. And the one I remember is, use a condom and you will learn no deposit, no return. <laughs> so if we had a podcast, we could get other people's contraceptive couplets for pills, for IUDs. I'm sure people would come up with fun ideas. <laughs> And we should laugh. I mean, I think it's very important for me. You know, these are slightly embarrassing, very sort of intimate things. And to make people smile is important and part of what we should be doing. Yeah, I think that's key. I mean, I wrote a, um, a little kind of blog piece about population being sexy and serious. And I think, you know, anything to do, population's taboo because uh, many people think that to talk about population implies coercion, which it does not necessarily. No. 
and uh, and talking about sex is taboo because it, it's something private and something that makes most of us feel uncomfortable. But I think that we really have to push on these, push back on these, because it's important for, for women's health, for baby's health, and for, for global sustainability. So I applaud what you're doing, and uh, it's, this has been a pleasure. I'd like to put a link in the show notes to that. It's actually on our site, so I'll send the link here. And uh, I hope you can also share Malcolm's um Pill, uh, Malcolm. If you want to bring people to liberatethepill.com, this is a good opportunity. Yes. Okay. I think it's a lot. Uh, we, we we are rewriting our company's um, website. We we'll do that in a couple of months. All right, and be sure to send us a photo of that thirty-four foot condom. Thirty-four feet across. Oh my god! <laughs> Seventy-six thousand cubic feet. Needed a serious wide-angle <laughs> lens for that guy. This is a you know, good example of a sort of patriarchal society. Every year, there's a huge condom festival in Albuquerque, and it's a special class, you know, for funny condoms. So uh, India has a elephant condom, and the people wouldn't allow our condom. They said it was disgusting. <laughs> but, of course, all the people that fly hot air balloons, you know, are liberal people, and they were furious, and I have a little badge. We got much more publicity because we couldn't... Uh, and I, I was on an airplane with Richard Branson and he does hot air balloons and I was telling him about my condom balloon and we got on very well about this. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, I've seen your photo of the condom hot air balloon, but I just searched it and you'll be surprised to know that since your um, endeavor, there are there's a whole condom air show, including a giant condom with a rabbit on the side of it called Safe Sexy. Wow. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Okay. Set an example and people follow it. That's great. It, it, I mean, one of the things we want is to be copied. We want other more people to do it than we do it. Well, Malcolm and Alicia, I always wanted to be a comedian. So thank you for actually surprisingly making the first comedy episode of the Overpopulation Podcast. <laughs> That's thanks to Malcolm. And uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for setting it up. I'm glad we overcame the technical difficulties. It's nice to know you both. And I look forward to hearing this and I'll, I'll follow your podcast. Malcolm, any last final thought or request? I don't think so. I mean, um, the pill is natural, safe and effective. Those are the three adjectives I would give to it. And it applies also to condoms and injury drying devices. Well, thanks for your lifetime of work. Thank you so much for taking the time, Malcolm and Alicia. This has been great. Thank you for this opportunity. All right. Well, I think I'll declare this uh, meeting adjourned. Happy World Contraception Day, <laughs> 2020. All right. Before we let you go, I want to talk in a little bit more detail about the Vancouver Sustainable Population Campaign that is underway now. Launched in Vancouver on the 21st of September, our messages alerting people to the fact that we're in an overpopulation crisis and celebrating the trend that's already underway towards solving it, which is couples choosing smaller families. And I guess some individuals choosing smaller families as well. So I want to just uh, say, if you're in Vancouver, Canada, hopefully you can't miss it. We're trying to make one planet, one child, a household word. We're really trying to more rapidly move society to this one child family norm. But if you're not in Vancouver, you can get the scoop at oneplanetonechild.org. We'll include that link in the show notes. We uh, are trying to get photographs of the billboards and video of the billboards as quickly as we can so that we can have those up on the website. But depending on when you're hearing this, you may or may not be able to see those at that website. Also related to that, we have decided to have a little contest. So for any of our listeners who are artists, or maybe you're not so much of an artist, but you are enthusiastic <laughs> about this billboard campaign. <laughs> Yes, uh, we welcome all artists and aspiring artists to submit what they want to see on a billboard, whatever image or concept that you have, any messaging. Um, we really want to try to engage in the public and try to get you guys all involved because this, as you know, is an effort that requires all of our attention and all of our expertise. And, you know, it's, it's not a one man show. So we are looking for everybody to share part in this really exciting project with us. So if you have an idea, send it our way. If you don't exactly have an idea and want some help making that idea come alive, definitely send us an email. We're more than happy to speak with you about it, to share more information about what this contest involves. And you can find out more on our World Population Balance Facebook page for details about our contest and also cash prizes. I was hoping you were going to mention that cash, serious cash. 
<laughs> yep. How much? How much are we giving away, Dave? Well, we're giving away hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I've forgotten what the first prize is, something like, what, $300 or maybe more. I forget. Oh, you gosh. get a bonus if you submit an idea that we can actually, you know, actually put out there. We might get some really brilliant ideas that are worthy of cash prizes, but for one reason or another, we can't put on a billboard bring them on. But we would really like to encourage you to give us an idea that we can really uh, implement. So there is cash behind that. And uh, and that reminds me that why are we doing this in Vancouver? Because an activist in Vancouver came up and said, hey, I love this billboard campaign. Bring it to my town. And you can do the same thing. You can bring our billboard campaign to your town. Best place to do, you'll find links in uh, the show notes and at oneplanetonechild.org. Uh, you know, you're going to have to help us with the funding, but uh, that's all. We do most of the hard work. We do most of the thinking, but we'd love to par partner with you. So we want this program to expand and spread, and we're really glad that it is. One other thing, Eric, I wanted to share was that if you uh, we're not big on just creating swag to, uh, you know, litter the planet, but, but we are, we have created t-shirts and coffee mugs and a couple of other things, some bumper stickers and stickers you can put on your water bottle, not to litter the planet, but to help get the word out. This is a good reason to manufacture a product if it's going to help us change the world. So yeah, I will put a link in the show notes that'll take you directly to the swag department so you can order your bumper sticker or t-shirt or whatever so you can do your part and help us spread the word. Lastly, I guess if you're going to, if you have feedback on this episode or you don't want to submit your billboard entry via Facebook, you can certainly email it to us, podcast at worldpopulationbalance.org. Well, that's it then for this edition of the Overpopulation Podcast. Thank you, Erica Arias, so much for joining me on this episode and for inviting Malcolm and Alicia to join us. That was such an interesting conversation. And thank you for the vital work you're doing at World Population Balance. For those of you listening, visit worldpopulationbalance.org to learn more about how we can solve overpopulation. At the website, you can sign the Sustainable Population Pledge. You can listen to all our podcasts, get on our email list, become a supporting member, make a donation to support our vital work. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. You can write to us because we want to hear from you and we often share your thoughts on the podcast. Please recommend this episode and any episode of the Overpopulation Podcast to others, friends, family members, anybody who's curious about this subject. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. It's free. All right. I'm Dave Gardner reminding you, we know how to solve overpopulation. What are we waiting for? 